You're listening to Themes and Memes, a different kind of movie review. Here with me, I have my co-host. Oh, I should probably introduce myself first. My name's Adam, <laughs> in case you missed it. <laughs> and here with me, I have my co-host, Aaron. And we also have special guest, Thomas Sheridan, um, who we've spoken with on a number of other occasions in the past. Um, so, how are you guys doing today? Doing well. I'm great, thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here, Thomas. It's great to talk to you again. No, it's great to hear your voices again. It seems like years. I think it has been years. <laughs> yeah, liter- literally, I think that's correct. Yeah. yeah, I think it's been about. <laughs> Maybe I'm just glad to be. St- I'm just glad to be still alive. That's probably what it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it's been about two years since we actually did a, a little roundtable like this. So it's going to be interesting to, to touch base again and, and see where we go. And we're going to review the film uh, The Exorcist, so the original from 1973. Um, this was actually something that Thomas suggested, um, so I hadn't really thought about it all that much, um, you know, since I first saw it when I was a teenager. And uh, to be honest, my memory wasn't that great. But after watching it again, I can see that there are a lot of interesting themes and, and threads that run through it, in relation to a whole bunch of different things. So what I'm going to do uh, is, as usual, just run through a quick synopsis of the plot, and then um, <clears throat> we can just kind of take it from there in terms of what what kind of our observations were and, and things like that. So. The film is, um, you know, set sort of like circa, circa late 60s, early 70s, and we, we first see this, this priest um, basically on, a, on an excavation dig in Iraq, and he comes across a, um, a statue of an ancient Babylonian demon called Pazuzu. And I think the story is that um, he, as a priest, as a Catholic priest, had previously done an exorcism involving this particular demon, you know, and so he was kind of shocked to uncover the statue of it because it's, you know, there's some kind of personal history there for him. The, um, the film then tracks across to, to Georgetown in Washington, D.C. And it shows the, the actress, um, what's her name, Chris, I think it is. And um, she's a single mother and uh, she's doing a film shoot uh, involving some kind of like a student protest at a university or something like that. And, um, you know, it basically just shows her going about her career and, and hanging out with her friends. And um, she's got a, you know, a young daughter called Reagan at home and... Um, Reagan, you know, mysteriously starts to exhibit all this weird behavior. You know, she, she first uh, starts looking at this Ouija board and playing around with that. And then she starts acting up and she's swearing and, and um, being rude. And I think she's stealing. And so the mother takes her to a, um, you know, to a psychiatrist. They can't figure out what's wrong with her, but simply say that it's, it's some kind of weird, uh, what they call hyperkinetic behavior. And so they prescribe her Ritalin, which is very interesting. They're not really interested in sending her to a psychiatrist, but they you know, put her on Ritalin. But um, things just continue to get worse with Reagan's behavior. She was becoming more and more um, obscene and out of control to the point where um, these uh, poltergeist sort of activities start happening. You know, the bed starts shaking. She's got, you know, it's like supernatural strength and all this type of stuff. And um, the mother's, you know, going out of her mind. There, there are also a number of mysterious deaths um, in their circles, of course, um, which are suspected that it might be something to do with her. And um, to cut a long story short, they continue trying to get help from the medical industry. So they're, they're taking her to psychiatrists and neurosurgeons, and, and they're basically throwing their hands up in the air and saying, we don't know. She's having scans and x-rays and all kinds of stuff done. And they eventually... Um, just give in and say, well, maybe what you need is a um, is a priest to perform an exorcism because we're out of options. And so this is what happens. You know, she um, she gets a local Catholic priest um, to to start filing a uh, a request to the Catholic Church to perform an exorcism on the young girl, and they send in the other priest who I mentioned at the you know the beginning of the film, the guy who was in Iraq, and um, they both the, the two of them both uh, perform this exorcism on the girl over a period of I think about an evening or a day or something. Now this older priest, um, Marin, his name is, he unfortunately dies of a heart attack during the exorcism, and the the younger priest, um, I think it was Damien, I think it was, he um, he eventually says to the demon, "Look, you know, take me instead." You know, and so the the demon takes possession of his body. He throws himself out a window and kills him. Kills himself to, sacri- to you know, sacrifices himself to save the young girl. And of course, that's basically the end of the story. So you know, the exorcism does work, um, although it, you know, costs the lives of, of both priests involved and other people within the film as well. So um, yeah, there's a, a lot going on in this film. Um, I think there's a whole bunch of different angles we could talk about. But I mean, just off the top of your head, Thomas, what you know, what, what would you say are some of the most interesting observations you made? 
Well, let me tell you about my history with this film. Mm. I can remember when I was a little kid in my parents' house and my aunt and uncle coming over. And they had seen the film like a few days before in the cinema when it was first released. And they were warning my parents not to go see it because they were having nightmares about it. It had affected them that deeply. And uh, my, my old man was laughing at them. And then he and my mother went to see the film and it freaked them out as well. So I had a very, what's the word, intense initial insight into the film at a very young age, but also a kind of a mystique where it already kind of had become culturally and psychologically and emotionally powerful inside me that I wanted to see it. And I, and I did not see it until I was about 17 and we got our first VCR. It was actually a Betamax, uh, Sony Betamax. And someone had taped an illegal copy of the film. And I just thought, I knew it was... I knew about the the scenes, such as the the this you know the the violent sort of like using the crucifix as a dildo, and I expected to laugh at the film because then I was like I'm seventeen, I'm you know I'm I'm different, I'm grown up, and I heard about it from my friends, and we laughed. But when I actually saw the film; it actually freaked me out big time. And even though I was well sort of you know appropriated with like slasher films and everything, video nasties as they called them back then, this film really affected me. And not to the point where I had nightmares, but I knew that there was something very special about this film, more than just the the terror and the the, the frightening thing. Now, we see that film today. To the average person, it, it would probably just be an interesting film. But let's go back to 1973 when it was released. You know, that was still they were still making hammer horror films, which were basically kind of like costume romps that didn't get particularly intense and that was the that was the level of horror and suddenly this remarkable film shows up that takes it to the extreme and i think it's like you have to sort of see it in in the period of the time and that was that was how the film affected me and i still i actually think it's one of the greatest movies ever made it's a masterpiece yeah it's it's certainly shot very well um but Aaron, aaron what were your thoughts on the film? Yeah, I I had read similar things to what Thomas is describing here as people's reactions to the film were so intense. And it has this uh, it has a reputation that's lasted to this day. And that's impressive because, as we're saying, um, <laughs> over the years, uh, things have gotten standards have changed where uh, you can get away with showing a lot more in fit film however i think the real thing going on here is that when you touch on super dark and and real things like this film does uh the disturbing aspect and and the violent aspect it actually works it's not just a dumb uh horror movie where you're just chopping people's arms off for no reason just to do it you know, like a guar concert or something. It's There's actually a meaning to it. And so that meaning is a mysterious one. It's it's one that kind of uh, seems straightforward uh, on the surface, but there's so much more. And, and I also like this film as a, a social critique, just a critique of the modern world as well. I'll just throw that in real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can I can see what you're we, we, going with there. I mean, we, we sort of touched on a few of those Um aspect of the you know the social critique factor you know via email before the po- for the podcast here and um i think that's definitely relevant in terms of uh, you know like the uh, the health industry you know so like pharmaceuticals but you know big pharma psychiatry that kind of thing um but i, I just want to throw in that i i sort of you know I, I totally agree with the um what you're saying about the relevance of the film and the time that it came out because this film had this this mystique and this kind of uh, reputation as being, you know, one of the most shocking films ever made. Now, I mean, I, I first saw it when I was a teenager, and I think I was um, I was at like a sleepover or something like that, and I just thought it was silly because I wasn't really paying attention. But after watching it again you now as an adult and looking back, I can definitely see how this would have been um, 
a, a truly disturbing film, you know, back in back in the day, because you know we, we're we're seeing the the total destruction of innocence. You know, this um, this young girl just just performing these absolutely obscene, lewd sexual acts and swearing and and you know all this type of stuff. And um, I think um, I'm not sure whether this is a, one of those urban legends or, or what have you, but um, I think the story was that when this first came out in the cinemas, they actually did have to have um, medical teams on standby. Um, outside the cinema because so many people were going into the film and coming out, you know, basically having some kind of a, you know, a nervous breakdown or a panic attack or, or something like that. I mean, do, do you know anything about that sort of all those stories, Thomas? No, I never heard that one, but that that's the kind of things that the the Hollywood people put out there before films have like gone on worldwide release. You, in those days, they would just they used to show them in the U.S. first. Mm. And then build up the hype there, and then they would travel around the world. So usually, when growing up in Ireland, you'd hear about the new film in America. That did you hear they have people that were like taking the hospital during it and things like that? It was brilliant marketing. But having said that, let's. I want to talk about the film a little deeper in terms of how, what I get from it. And what I get from it is that I don't even see a horror film. I actually see a beautiful story of two of of a mother trying to win her daughter back and two complete strangers two catholic priests who owe this woman nothing i don't even think she's catholic i think she's protestant in the in this in the story and they're willing to give their lives and they do in order to return a child back to its mother mm. now that this film could have fallen to pieces very easily it could have it could have been laughable it could have been a joke but what those two elements i think well there's three elements that I think really brought it home. One, the acting is outstanding. I think Ellen Borston is incredible, and Linda Blair for a child was unbelievably good. You know, tell me, tell me a child actor that could pull that role off and be remembered for it for this day, without it being cutesy like a Spielberg film, like you know, Close Encounters or E.T. Mm. Secondly, it looks amazing, and I think it was nominated for an Oscar for cinematography. You pay a ca- careful attention to how it's made. It looks like it looks like a Vermeer painting in how it's lit, or a Caravaggio painting, I should say, in how it's lit. It's the scenes are soft. There's a seamless transitions from the exterior outside scenes into the interior scenes. That's a very very difficult thing to do artistically and technically, especially back then. Also, Friedkin, the guy who made it, was quite a unique director who understood. Things were on the line with this film, and he basically, Ellen Burstyn referred to him as a maniac. In order to keep everybody in a state of hypertension, he used to do things like fire off guns beside, beside the actors' heads <laughs> and things like that, or, or, or call them, or insult them and call them names, keeping them constantly in a state, a, a state of hypervigilance and terror. And that becomes very apparent because if you, there's a scene in that film where it changes. And it's actually one of the most frightening scenes in the film is when she co- appears at the, there's a kind of like a dinner party and there's some like kind of namby pamby priest singing show tunes on the piano. <laughs> and then yeah. there's, an, there's an astronaut there mm. as well. The show, the, like, the show that she's part of American high society. Yeah. Mm. And then the little mm. girl walks in in her, in her little nightgown and she says to the astronaut, you're going to die up there. And then she urinates all over the floor. And from that point in the film on, it's you, you can really see the tension levels change. Now, he was doing things, Friedkin, like surrounding the sets in refrigeration units. So it was constantly cold. So the actors were never relaxed. And you could see the steam from the breath and things like this. That's why it cost, it cost a staggering $10 million to make when it was made. Just because in a pre-CGI day, you literally have to do things like that. And it's made some like half a billion cents in profits. But the film is never spoken about in terms of a masterpiece of a movie because where you can do anything with computers. Back then, it was literally all rough and ready. It was people shaking the bed, putting up fridges, and but the actually the masterful use of light. Watch it again and be amazed by the light. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, De- definitely a good film. And and picking up where. You were uh, talking about how it's a story about a mother and her child and uh, the selfless um, selfless acts of others to keep that relationship going. 
I, I definitely um, enjoyed the aspect of the mother doing everything that she possibly could by following the rules, you know, going to the doctors, yeah. mm. uh, consulting them. And they're just, besides not being helpful, they're very uh, harmful. They're, they're arrogant and they subject the poor girl to all these traumatic tests, which are obviously not going to help anything. And also, when, when she's on the bed and she's being possessed by this demon, she's flying around doing all these crazy things that are unexplainable. And the doctors, are there, they're, they're not just listening about this story as a story. They're seeing it. And then after seeing it, they go, well, we just have to conduct more tests. And yeah. they're completely unable to concede to the fact that they can't do anything. Yeah. And that medical science just has no place in this. They just keep going, being hard-headed about and, and arrogant, and be like, oh, yeah, let's just put it in front of another machine and it'll work itself out. Yeah. Oh, until, Linda Bragg, until Linda Bragg grabs one of the doctors by the balls and lifts them up. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely, you know, was thinking about that at the time because, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's very striking the way in which, um, the, you know, the, these psychiatrists are actually witnessing paranormal events with their own eyes. So she's, you know, the, the bed is rocking and she's floating off the bed. She's gone pale. She's talking in this deep kind of demonic voice, and, and then their answer is, well, uh, it's all in her head. You know, the problem, the problem is not her bed. The problem is in her mind, you know, and it's like you've just seen something occur in the physical world that is, you know, obviously outside the realm of her own mind. And yet they're, they're still um, sticking to this line of, um, yeah, the, the psychiatric or not even psychiatric, but just this pure like um, pharmaceutical approach. And as again, as I said, the, um, the their first answer or solution is, is to put her on Ritalin, which I thought was very, very interesting. And they just kept on going with that, where it was like, yeah, no, it's um, it's, it, we need tests, we need drugs. And um, the other aspect, which uh, which is interesting, is that they really seem to be quite down on the notion of psychiatry in this. You know, the um, you, uh, she's at one of these uh, sort of it seems to be quite an elite kind of a hospital or asylum or what have you, and um, they're discussing you know possible treatment plans and whatnot, and. Um, they, uh, yeah, they really, they really sort of um, dismiss the idea that this could be something that could be resolved through some kind of a therapeutic, psychiatric, or, or psychological process. You know, that, that they're looking at it in a purely reductionistic manner, where it's, it's just, oh, something is wrong with the brain. You know, that the brain needs to be altered or tuned or you know fixed with chemicals. You know, and so that really, really stood out to me. It was kind of the precursor of the kind of Richard Dawkins. Brian Cox mindset that like, you know, this sort of cognitive dissonance in the face of things they can't understand. Mm. It just doesn't exist to them. They don't, yeah. will not entertain the idea that this is, you know, there was a time even back then where a scientific person would, would say something like, I don't know, it's a mystery. But in this film is unique in that the fact that they don't even want to acknowledge that it exists. Yeah. And then they eventually throw it off to the Catholic Church not because they failed, but they somehow imply that the mother has failed. And that's why she loses her nut with them. Yeah. She goes, after all this money and everything, you're sending me to a bunch of witch doctors, something like this. But it was almost like she was responsible. The child yeah. was responsible. Science could possibly not never be wrong. Yeah, it's like, it's mm -hmm. like because, because, the, um, because these events don't fit into the uh, mechanistic scientific model, then by definition, yeah. they cannot exist. You know, and then, and, and because the scientific model and method um, is infallible, then therefore it must be something wrong. You know, with the, as you say, with the mother. You know, it's kind of yeah. Absurd. Yeah, that is that's dark. Now, that's that's one of the darkest elements of the movie. I think it's just the struggle that the mother is going through. And if you're talking about artistic, uh, this film being artistic and well done, I think the way they did those scenes with the machines was yeah. brilliant. Yeah, yeah like the how noise terrifying. The, yeah, the noises. Oh god! When she's having a temporal lobe examination, and they put the eye down the side of her head. Yeah, it, it's this brutal sort of like meaty, rough and ready nineteen seventies science, yeah. medical science. <clears throat> yeah, that was that was yeah. disturbing. I, I I remember that it was um, this is traumatized like young girl is, is lying there in a in a gown on the on this bed, and you've just got these enormous big industrial machines whizzing around, going bang 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 like a jackhammer or something, yeah. you know. And it's, yeah. you know, this is supposed to be helping her supposedly. Yeah, the Pazuzu would seem like a better option in that case. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And this is before the possession is taken like 
full has become full on. So, so, uh, I don't know if it's implying that you, that aided in the process. Well, I, I didn't really get that, but I've yeah. got a little, I've got a little interesting. Uh, yeah. I that. think there's actually a point there that you made Aaron. That's bang on. I think that actually did something to it made it worse. Well, get this in the film, the, the point at which she seems to cross across a threshold, shall we say with the possession where she, her behavior goes from being strange and rude to, you know, outright obscene and possessed is actually the point where she's in the hospital. And I think it's when she gets injected with something. And I found that very interesting because, you know, her behavior changes markedly at the point that the needle goes into her arm. She's injected with some kind of a serum or, or whatever it is. It's not explained what it is, but it's at that point where the, there's some kind of device that's, that's, um, used to show that at that point, as this, you know, needle is going in, that, that she's becoming fully possessed at that point. I think she sees a, a, you know, a, a demonic face in her own mind, you know, that the music sort of swells behind this all. And yeah, and, and things kind of go down from there. So I, I'm wondering as to whether there was some kind of a hint or, or message going on with re regarding, yeah, the, the treatment she was getting and whether that actually induced this, you know, possession to a higher degree or what have you. Well, talking about the idea of the trauma inducing it, let's look at the whole, this is what I love about the film is all these sort of like, everyone is sort of like not only exercising her, but exercising themselves. It begins with her playing with a Ouija board mm. in a family that the mother and father just broke up. She's the perfect age for what they'd call a poltergeist experience. She's on the cusp of puberty. Mm -hmm. The family is breaking up. This is when, this is usually the classic poltergeist scenario and things start flying around a young girl approaching or at the start of puberty and there's problems in the home either a breakup or pedophilia or something like that or financial problems or alcoholism so that's a perfect starts off in a perfect kind of uh poltergeist type thing you think it's going to start off by that there's one then she, there's one scene she becomes more less and less so we say vital in her behavior as her, especially the scene when her mother screams at her father on the phone, you can't be at your daughter's bed to you, in this kind of thing, right? Mm. Right after that, there's a scene where she films something in the, she films a, a scene outdoors where it's like a, a Vietnam War protest in the movie she's making. She comes back to the house, I think, and there's a part in, that, in the film right there where she walks into the darkened kitchen and nearly everyone switches, a, uh, switches it off but Pazuzu arrives in the house and his face is shown in the corner of the movie in the dark. Go back and watch it again. Just before she walks into the kitchen, Pazuzu's face lights up as a small, about the size of a tennis ball, in the darkness, and then she switches on the light. And that's to announce that Pazuzu, the demon, is now in the home. And then you have the thing with the rats in the attic and all this, what they call the noises in the attic. It's really quite frightening when you start thinking it because she's invited Pazuzu into the home using the Ouija board. Mm. Now, on top of the other traumas, there's other traumas. Everyone else is being brought together by a trauma. And if you, if you, ever, if you look into the history of things like demonic possession and things like that, and believe even the idea of the demons coming into a community, it's very commonly happens around this idea of trauma. There's a, in the idea of the Jewish tradition in Eastern Europe, you have this thing called the Dibbuk. The Dibbuk is like a jinn. It's like the Hebrew version of the jinn. And there's like writers like Ivis Beshevet Singer wrote an amazing short story called The Last Demon, where the demon has survived the massacre and the pogroms of this Jewish community in Poland. The demons are associated with problems, disasters, trauma. And there's loads of this going on in the film. You have Ellen Burstyn breaking up with her husband. You have the priest, the younger priest, Father Karras. He can't provide for his aging, dying mother. His brother is giving him a hard time, saying, what use are you? You made no, you're on your education. What did you become a priest? This kind of thing. Mm. So he's riddled with guilt. He's, his pivotal moment of when his sort of like engaging with the possession begins when he sees a homeless person in the subway and he goes, can you spare some change for a Catholic father? This kind of thing. And then that, that, that voice is then echoed by the demon later on in the film. This kind of thing. The housekeeper is suspected of being a Nazi. Yes. By the friend of her, Jack McGowan, who incidentally, incidentally died right after the film was killed, was, was made. And he was the first person killed in the movie by the demon. Mm -hmm. Now that's, 
so in the film, he actually is the first one do- killed by the demon because he was wise to the fact that, the, that maybe the guy was a Nazi and the demon did know this, an, an ex-Nazi. And then there's all the other things going on, like you have the, the older priest knows he's, he's, he has a date with destiny, he's probably going to die. It's a, When you start like really thinking about it, you see a, a tremendous, you see a film that's almost got this kind of like Dostoevsky, Tolstoy kind of layering of characters inside it. And this is why I was amazed when I saw the original review in the New York Times from 1973 by some dingbat film reviewer. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a point we go to, who completely missed the point of what that film was about. He talked about it like it was Carry On Screaming or something, like a joke film. And yet, mm-hmm. that's because we have a different per- perception and engagement with things like the occult, particularly in the alternative movement. It's all over society now. It represented in everything from like heavy metal music, you know, everything, right? Today, than we did back then. And I think that's really show what that film is really showing us and teaching us is the further we have we, the further we have become pazuzuified, use that expression, hmm. the less shocking that movie is. Yeah, that's 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 a very interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I go back and forth too, because it definitely is less shocking, but at at the same time, for anybody who 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 has looked at occult matters and done it seriously, I feel like the film, again, you actually take meaning from it for one thing, but it's also more disturbing. And, and, and it doesn't become about like the, uh, the visual, the blood and all the horrible. Uh, it, it's, it's more about the act of this girl saying all these weird sexual things just to begin with. Like what the, that doesn't even make sense. But, yeah. Well, that, that is, I, um, I, yeah, that, that 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 is interesting. I was thinking about this last night when I was watching it, and um, <clears throat> I, I find it interesting that we, when we when we talk about an illustration of outright evil and destruction of innocence um, and things that are supposed to disturb us on the deepest level, what we're talking about here is the idea of a young girl, so somebody, an, an, an archetype of innocence, um, displaying grotesque, lewd, uh, sexual behavior. So the, the, the idea that the sexual is something that when it's out of context um, can, is the most disturbing thing. You know, I, I think mm. we kind of take that for granted. You know, we, we, we all uh, are appalled when we, we hear about um, things like sexual abuse and pedophilia and uh, other kind of like inappropriate or abusive behaviors. Um, but, you know, I, I, I was just really thinking about why is that, you know, um, and, and, and how well this kind of fits, you know, into the idea of, of again, the destruction of innocence, that this is not so much about you know the the, the young girl <clears throat> throwing up or or sort of floating off her bed, but the, the the most disturbing things are when she makes these these lewd sexual gestures and and comments and things like that. I mean, again, you know this this would have been so much more disturbing uh, back in 1973, but I mean even today, it is disturbing, but but perhaps not as much as it was back then. And so yeah. I, I see what you're yeah. saying. It's um. You know, we, we've all become, it's like you were saying, Thomas, that we've all become pazuzuified to the point where, although this is obviously distasteful and offensive, it is nowhere near as distasteful and as offensive as it would have been back then, you know? Yeah, where, where was Miley Cyrus back then? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there were, there were no it was Miley in there. the charts. It was like quote, completely innocent by today's standards. Yeah. See, if we look, it's, it's, that's what's amazing about it. I, I think, like, just like Carl Jung said, art has the ability to predict the future you know the things like her grabbing the guy and saying lick me lick me mm. a 12 13 year old girl yeah well not wasn't miley cyrus this like teen child star of disney and these are the kind of things she does on stage now not that long later i might add oh. yeah it, that, that that that's what's so interesting about it this would yeah. you know another thing that's interesting is they had two jesuit priests on yes. the set <laughs> as yeah. advisors Oh. Now, whether mm-hmm. we're getting some kind of Freudian insight into their minds, probably, or yeah. as if they were some kind of somehow warning us that this will come. I'm not a Christian, so it doesn't bother me that way. But mm. I find that very interesting. I find it very interesting that the Catholic Church loved this movie. That they, they yeah. completely 
well, a crusade is two Catholic priests as heroes, totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. exactly. They're, they're, they're the two that give their lives selflessly for a little girl. So, yeah, it, it couldn't be better uh, in terms of depiction of the characters on film. Yeah, and it kind of, um, in a way, it. I mean, I'm not sure about what was going on in the Catholic Church at that time in particular, but of course, we, we know that, you know, the, the Catholic Church is unfortunately well known for, um, you know, abuse scandals of, you know, child abuse involving priests and children. And so in this film, what we're seeing is that the, the abuse comes at the hand of a demon and that the abuse is uh, resolved, that it's ended. The situation is, is yeah, um, yeah, is resolved by the Catholic Church. So it's, it does it makes sense that they would that they would like the depiction given there you know because it, it, yeah. i guess um yeah it, go, it goes huh. it, it goes against common perceptions of of child abuse in the catholic church by presenting them as the heroes and the saviors of someone who has been abused by you know this possession the two well, advisors oh i'm sorry go, go ahead, ahead sorry go, you go ahead no i spoke you go ahead Aaron. I was just to say the two advisors mirror perfectly the two priests on screen in, in that regard and and in in terms of the title character of the exorcist the father marin uh, to me he kind of came off as being a guy who's beyond religion uh he, he's he's a guy who's a jesuit priest and a scholar but uh your introduction to him is as an archaeologist uh, digging up mesopotamian ruins you know you, you don't know he's a jesuit priest at the beginning you think he's an archaeologist it's only later at the end of the film that he dons the uh his um his vestment and all that but earlier in the film when he's in uh iraq he kind of like walks by uh these muslims um kneeling toward mecca and all that he kind of walks by without even looking at him you know and it, to me it just kind of implied like religion didn't really matter to him he was more into like studying uh civilization and the dark sort of occult forces that have existed throughout time and, and how they manifest themselves. And, and he, he's this guy who's this sort of outsider within the church itself. Cause, cause the other uh, people at Georgetown and, and the other Catholic guys that decide to bring him in are like, well, yeah, where is he? I don't know. Like he, he nearly died a few years back. He's writing a book. I don't know. We'll call him in, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Interesting. Character. There's, an also, there's an, there's an, in, an intriguing scene at the very beginning too, when he first digs up the statue of Pazuzu. And he, mu he mutters something, and you have to have the subtitles on. And what he says is evil, evil against evil. Ooh. And that's an interesting comment in light of what Adam was just saying. Mm. I find that quite, I found that very strange, that scene. And yeah. then he goes and faces Pazuzu as a giant statue in the desert. as two dogs whipping each other to bits. And then you have the wind, which is what Pazuzu represents. Mm. He's the he's the he's the demon of the southwest the wind, south east wind, mm. sorry southwest wind. And you have that. So that you know, whoever made that film had definitely done their their homework into sort of demonology in, in Babylonia and things like that, and artistically brought it very well into the film. But that scene always was very strange: evil against evil whatever that meant. And then the clock stops later on too, as well, that, that, that the opening scene alone is something that needs a lot more, uh, this, it, it, you know, a lot more viewing is like, why did he leave the Catholic church and go work as an archeologist in <laughs> Iraq? Was he aware of evil within the church? Mm. Mm. And yeah. that's why he said evil against evil. Did, you know, he dug the thing out of the ground. It's like the whole archetypal thing, the Jungian idea of anything dark is buried in the subconscious mind. But if you don't deal with it, it comes flying up to the surface. Was Father Marin himself sent to Iraq because he was a pedophile? Mm. Yeah. You know, there's like endless questions there. Endless questions. Yeah, yeah. I, there are some... I, I was thinking about the, the notion of... Um, of either Father Marin and or some of the other psychiatrists we see in this film having some kind of a, a broader or higher understanding of what's going on because there are certain, there are certain little aspects of his demeanor, certain way that they speak, uh, you know, inflections and such. Um, that, again, this goes for, for some of the psychiatrists as well and also the investigator, the detective, who's, on the, who's kind of yeah. on the scene yeah. just sort of investigating and asking questions in the background. I just... 
I mean, I haven't really fleshed this out, but I've just kind of, I got an intuitive kind of a gut feeling that with some of these characters, these more senior characters, shall we say, within the film, that there was some kind of a knowledge of what was going on that they weren't um, necessarily telling everybody about, that um, either this, uh, you know, the Father Merrin, uh, you know, knew what was happening and knew the history of this demon or, or, what, or the, sort of some, some deeper meaning as to what the story was that he wasn't sharing, that perhaps some of these psychiatrists knew that this was something more arcane, um, more serious and more occult. Yeah. Um, and same thing goes with the investigator, or this detective at least anyway as well, that he seemed to have been piecing things together um, you know, yeah. a, a lot quicker than anybody else. And he didn't let it on. He was just asking questions and being very flippant and just, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm just sort of turning over some rocks, etc. But yeah, I just kind of got the <laughs> gut feeling that um, that some of these characters um, were were sort of um, were keyed in or tuned in to, to, to the deeper sort of story or, or that perhaps knew what was going on and weren't letting on. I mean, did you guys pick up on any of that at all? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, definitely with the investigator. I mean, he leads on Damien by saying, yeah, yeah, don't you think these, uh, <laughs> you, all these desecrations of the church, and what do you think of this? And he's kind of implying that he already knows. Yeah. And he goes, uh, uh, Damien is like, oh, yeah, I wrote a paper on that. And, and the investigator goes, oh, yeah, I read it. Mm. So he clearly knows what's going on, you know. And he yeah, leads I the mother in the same way. Yeah, yeah. I love the character played by Lee J. Cobb of the of the the cop, and I love the you can actually see he has a genuine affection. He wants it, friendship with the fat the younger priest, Father Caris. Yeah, you can right. see that, but it's almost like he's really much more interested in the older priest. Mm. Which you know, especially when he says, "Did you, he says to him, did you know how Burke, whatever his name was, the film director, died? His head was turned turned around completely backwards. How would a child do that?" So he. Thinks that this, and then he says to him, "What do you think? Some kind of sick priest in the diocese?" Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He's specifically looking there. I'd forgotten that part. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's interesting. It's it's almost as if he seems to have clicked onto the fact that this was a position before anybody else. You know, this is kind of intimated through some of these questions and comments that he makes. That yeah, he understands that this is most likely what's going on. He can't come out and say it and tell everybody that that's what he thinks is going on, but he's, he's leading people toward that sort of conclusion or toward the exorcism through kind of suggestion and through questioning. Yeah. So. You know what else should be mentioned is that this all takes place at Georgetown University yes. In, yes. Uh, in Washington, D.C. Yeah. So uh, you've got so many uh, huge things going on. You've got high society, high society convening. Yeah. You've got a, a film being uh, filmed here. You've got... Uh, major academic institution, which is uh, run by the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church. You've got academia, you've got the church, you've got the state with Washington, D.C. So, uh, that, clearly, uh, this film's making a commentary on all that. I, I'm not quite sure what all that is, to be honest. Well, this... well, America was still knee-deep in the Vietnam War at that time, so that might have something to do with it as well. America was tearing itself apart for the first time in its history. In seventy three, because of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that that is interesting. I mean, just it just got me thinking about some of the some of the shots that you see. Um, you know, this is in relation to the whole idea of this this whole story taking place within a kind of elite high society setting. So, you know, again, you've got you know Georgetown, Georgetown University. You've got uh, you know the, the sort of the entertainment industry, and then you've got all of these um, psychiatrists or whatever they are. You know, the, the doctors that that. Um, the girls being taken to they all they seem to be at the the higher end of the spectrum you know that they're, they're sort of these big prestigious hospitals and you know even the church as well that we're looking at um you know big grandiose churches when when they when they uh when the, he's making an application to um to the other priests to perform the exorcism or to get permission to perform the exorcism which is interesting we should talk about that but i noticed that um they they have a lot of the same decor and it kind of reminded me of so, sort of a masonic decor in a lot of ways because you see in the church and the church itself um they have a a what is it a, a white and red uh, checkerboard uh, floor pattern and you also see a white and red checkerboard floor pattern in the asylum um and i think you also see it in the um you know in the offices of the of the jesuits as well um or at least in one other location so you know when when you see these these same sort of um symbolic patterns popping up again and again it yeah it does remind me of the um 
yeah, the, the kind of elitist overtones in that. Um, so yeah, the, the, the fact that it was shot in you know Georgetown and revolving around the university, revolving around these elite academic institutions, and revo revolving around the the highest levels um, of the Catholic Church, at least in that area, is very interesting, isn't it? It also tells us something about the Catholic Church in different ways too. Like they were, they were trying to break away from their sort of spooky reputation. They're really, they don't want it to, to have the exorcist exorcism. You know, it's that. Yeah. Like she probably yeah. has to oh, beg yeah. him, yeah. and then he's extremely cynical, Father Caris himself. Yeah. But eventually, it goes ahead. Now, I was reading a very funny art. Well, not funny, but like very ironically funny amusing shall i say article the other day where the catholic church can't get exorcist anymore because the young priests have just scared <laughs> so even in the catholic church we have this snowflake phenomena you know the phenomena of the snowflake where we have uh, a generation that's grown up that's afraid of everything and they need safe spaces yeah. and uh, you know they, they 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 suffer microaggressions and they're offended by everything and they've got a great fear they're, they're easily rattled and disturbed and they need safe spaces because mm. they're all snowflakes. And so that, that phenomenon is showing up in the Catholic Church. Now, this is, you know, here we go again, right? In the film, <coughs> excuse me, in the film, Pazuzu attacks the most innocent element in the cent epicenter of this Georgetown thing that represents the universities, the Hollywood people, the astronauts, the top, top, knobs in the church it goes for a little girl the innocent thing right so this element of the 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 demons can only possess the most innocent flowers and we're we're entering a society what i'm seeing it online even where people like if you look at anything these any kind of millennial newsletters or websites like i don't know like dangerous minds or vice Mm. They're, they, they actually, I and mean, you look at the, the kind of people who will actually turn a blind eye to Hillary Clinton's, you know, mass murdering genocide in order to point out what an evil man Donald Trump is because he says grab him by the pussy, <laughs> which mm -hmm. doesn't kill anybody, but she's killed God knows how many thousands. They're, they have a fear. They think anything that happened before the year 2000 is disgusting and offensive. Yeah. You see that? There's a generation of soft, wimps and weaklings coming along and mm. if there's a lesson in that film the exorcist for the society today it's that we're there we have a generation that's growing up that will probably be extremely easily possessed by mm. whatever archetypes of pursuers come along yeah because in a way they're more naive than ever and very innocent in, in that sense <laughs> and Something I really liked was uh, that it showed the Catholic Church as you'd think they'd be all on board. Yeah, yeah, we do exorcisms. Yeah, it's a spiritual matter. Yeah, we're the church. That's who you go to. Hey, thanks for coming to us. But no, again, the, the church kind of wants to change its image because all those old sort of silly religious ideas are outdated now. Mm. And scientism was so big that the Jesuits knew that like, hey, look, we have to get on board with this. We're the learned academic order of this church, so we're the ones who have to do that. Georgetown University is our one of our big uh, tools for doing that in the U.S. So, um, yeah, yeah, and then you've got the character of Damien just exuding everything about that, where he just cannot believe the spiritual side of this. And, you know, he in the beginning goes, yeah, I'm struggling with my faith. Because he'd gone through all this training, all these different universities in psychiatry, all that um, – any sort of religious or quasi spiritual ideas are just beat out of him yes. because it, it was a professional thing. He was getting professional yeah. training and it just beats that all out of you. Yeah. That, uh, that's, that's very interesting because we, we see this, you know, he's again, as you say, he's very resistant to the idea that this could be real. Um, the, the whole notion of him being a Jesuit um, and a priest and he, you know, he's working in these um, mental hospitals as a psychiatrist or what have you. He's, yeah, he's, he's very resistant to all that because the, the idea of his career and, and his faith, are, are, yeah, they're, they're sort of intermingled where it's just kind of like a day job to him. You know I mean? Obviously he's, he's suffering a crisis of faith anyway because of the death of his mother, but um you know, it's it's interesting when you see that when the mother is um, 
you know, the mother of the girl, Regan, when she is, you know, uh, approaching him and saying, look, we need you to do this exorcism, he is talking about all of these bureaucratic processes and evidence and, and, and making a, a formal appeal or, sorry, a formal um, request to the Catholic Church. And it's like, oh, we can't just go ahead and do an exorcism. We've got to get, we've got to collect our evidence. Then we've got to submit it to this person. And we need this particular bit of evidence. And then they've got to give permission. And so they've, they've kind of turned it into this kind of scientific bureaucratic nightmare when what we're supposed yeah. to be dealing with here is some a, a matter of faith. It's a matter of me metaphysics. It's supposed to be more about, you know, uh, you know, empathy and intuition and and goodwill and all these types of things but the um the elevation of uh, you know the the catholic faith into the highest levels of academia um, and bureaucracy results in this complete um yeah this this kind of stonewalling where she's trying to you know just get this guy to come and heal her daughter and he's talking about all of these um yeah again these these bureaucratic processes and about trying to find the evidence and all does is this actually going to qualify for exorcism and there's there's even one one, one scene where he he says, well, what we need is we need to get evidence of her speaking in a language that she's never spoken in before, you know, and then we also need to get some evidence of like, uh, you know, yeah. some other, what is it, you know, strength, you know, super, supernatural strength or something. And it's, it's, it's like he's crossing off these um, boxes on a form or something like that, you know, and I, I just found that was, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. The, what you said there about the the evidence that the priest wants, what 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 brings it to him in the end is when he puts on his dead mother's voice. Oh yeah, when, that was very, that I chilled when I first saw that scene. And later on, the priest says to him, the older priest, Father Marin says to him, the demon is a liar. Never believe a word it says, because the attack it uses is a psychological attack. And I thought that was that that was brilliantly done in that scene because you the, the actor who played. Father Karras almost like froze in his steps. Mm. You could hear like you know, and then he tried to play it cool with the demon, like uh, not it was not in the show that he was terrified or shocked or let the demon knew uh, knew on what he was talking about. That she she actually said the exact words, the last words he'd ever heard his mother his mother say. You know, why mm. do you leave me, Damy? Something like that. It was quite frightening. And then at one point. He has an hallucination and sees his mother inside Linda Blair's body. Yeah, during I, I, the actual exorcism. I, I think the depiction of of evil in this um, in this film was very very interesting because it, what, what what they're showing you is that well, there's, well, there's a number of scenes where the uh, the demon is trying to fool um, the the younger priest, and um, you know as as you say with the uh, putting on his mother's voice, and you know the, the older priest is saying, "Don't listen. It's it's all a psychological attack. You can't actually engage with this thing. You've just got to keep uh, you know keep keep the course and and just keep uh, you know going ahead with the with the process here." And um, <clears throat> I I just thought that was uh, there was you know a, a really kind of a striking yeah depiction of of what evil is because it it can't be creative. You know it's 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 um. It, it has no real power. It's like the all of all of the scary, intimidating, shocking things that that it does to try and engender fear and submission from the people around it um, are basically like parlor tricks in a lot of ways. It's all to do with uh, you know making a door slam or, or levitating a bed or or what have you. But you know when it's shown that um, the demon is unsuccessful in trying to. And, and trying to sort of undermine this this priest, you know, he, he says that um, you know he's putting on the mother's voice and it's saying, well, okay, well, if, if you know, you know, the story of my mother and all the rest of it, then what was her maiden name? And the demon just you know throws up some green slime instead of answering the question. <laughs> yeah. you know, it gets angry, yeah. you know. So it's it's basically getting angry over the fact that um, it's been exposed as a fraud. You know, that it's it's yeah. uh, all of its supposed power. Is is to do with image. It's to do with uh, it's theatrics. You know what I mean? And, and it, it can't be creative. It has no real power. Um, it's all it's all to do with psychologically getting you to believe that it's got power. And I thought that was very very interesting in terms of a depiction of of what evil really is. It's also like true. How... It's oh, true. So sorry. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's oh. also true. The demon that uh, that Crowley and Newberg summoned up in the desert runs on three three three. The, the demon is very similar to Pazuzu in that it is a nonsense maker. And very the way you banish Karanzon 333 is very similar to how, uh, you know, Karas dealt with the demon by calling it, by bluffing it and calling it out as a bullshitter. 
because that's the that's the thing with the de- this is the thing in the occult de- demons and Crowley wrote some very extensively on this that they're nonsense makers that they will when they when they possess someone that they will create lies and nonsense in order to distort yeah. and the more you engage with them and like I, I read a fabulous thing recently that someone sent me by a guy who was like way up in the OTO about Qurans on on the on things like Facebook, and it's it, it's basically you can spot Qurans on sort of footprint on people on Facebooks by when they go complete when they try to derail conversations, they spout nonsense that goes nowhere, and when you immediately ignore them, they die. This is like the this is the trait of Qurans on, and probably Pazuzu as well. We you know, I'm just assuming it that. Is this idea that the demon's power is only developed by the engagement with it? Yes. So therefore, the more you're engaging with the demons, so we say, mystique, the demon's persona, like the whole thing I do with the psychopaths, no contact ever again. Mm. Just get the fuck away and do not engage on any level, and you diminish its power. And Adakaris was figuring that out, and that's why it vomited in, in his face. Because yeah. at one point, it even says, "Well, who are you? I'm the devil." Yeah. And Karis <clears throat> plays a Karis plays a you know a blinder by just saying, "I don't believe you," like shrugging his shoulders. Really, I don't believe you. Yeah, yeah. It it's it's good how it brings it back to the psychological aspect too. It doesn't mm. negate that. <coughs> and and how, how so much that goes on in your own head can get the best of you. And in in the occult tradition, it's it's long been understood that like mental illness and all sorts of forms of insanity can be induced just by giving energy to these you know quote unquote demons in your own head. If you obsess uh, over all these horrible things that happen in your life, if if uh, Damien uh, Father Karen were to do that and just continually think about his mother, he would drive himself to insanity. And you could say that he might be uh, possessed by a demon. And here, maybe yeah. he's, um, y- you know, all the knowledge of that, too. At the same time, all the knowledge of psychiatry and that that can happen won't save you. You have to have, like, this fortitude and just saying no and, and being like, okay, okay I, it's like an experience that no amount of knowledge can help you with. However, you know, if you use knowledge the correct way and you actually <laughs> you, you actually do use it, then, then that can help you, too. So it's, it's saying all sorts of different things at the same time, which I like. Yeah. It certainly isn't. I, I I think what I like about that the most is that the there is a um. I guess I guess I guess the again getting back to the sort of portrayal of evil and what evil is and how you deal with it. I mean, it just reminded me so much of of yeah, like what you were saying before, Thomas. Of the like, I suppose like the cluster B personality disorders, you know, um, where yeah, there there is no um, there is no way that you can sort of, I guess, force your way through it. Um, you, you can't, you can't argue with it. You can't debate it. You can't fight it on its own terms. You know, you, you, there's no way of engaging with it. You simply have to have this kind of, you know, the, the no contact ever again or the ignoring it, you know, because the only, it, it, it gets all of its power through your consent, you know, um, through, through your willingness to engage with it. And I thought that was, yeah, again, brought out fantastically, you know, in the film. And it actually reminded me, um, I, I, um, it was kind of scary watching this film, you know, for a second time because I actually had my own kind of poltergeist experience when I was about thirteen, I think, and um, yeah, it, it makes me makes me wonder, you know, about um, you know the the psychological and spiritual elements of of perhaps inviting something in and how, you know, history has shown so many times that um, these possessions and these kind of poltergeist experiences often happen to to you know prepubescent children, you know. Who are just going into puberty, and they've, you know they've got personality issues, you know, hormonal things taking place, and that, um, yeah, heavy pot smokers too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about like casual users. I'm talking about you know like the types who are waste, who are smoking from the morning to get up in the morning to when they go to bed. It's uh, what happens. Two functions for this. One. They be, a lot of heavy pot smokers tend to be very self-absorbed, mm. obsessed with themselves. And this, this self-obsession often leads to a, a sort of like a pathological victim complex. Poor me. Poor me. 
this couple with the fact that when you uh, when someone's a heavy pot smoker, they don't dream. When you don't dream, you become psychotic. This is a uh, been this is like a well known, you know, neurological function. You stop dreaming, you eventually become psychotic. And a lot of these people, you have these murders that have happened on people who smoke. You know, a lot of them where they smoke heavy, heavy, heavy amounts of weed. And I'm not putting down people who want to smoke weed. I'm talking about the ones who are just, it's just like alcoholics. It's there all the fucking time. They have, a, they, they, the same kind of things happen, have happened with them. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's very interesting. I actually do believe there are demonic forces. Now, I'm not saying they're actually beings or anything like that. Then we give them names. We call them Pazuzu. We call them Karanzon 333, Astaroth, BLZ. We give, these are just names we give the fuckers. But what they are, are they are forces of the psyche that are almost like viruses that affect the biology, except they affect the psyche. And if you don't have a good immune system in your biology, you will get all kinds of infections. Well, they're the same thing with your psyche. If you don't have a developed or a good psyche, so you say you're, you're, you're a heavy drug user, an alcoholic, you're under extreme trauma, you're suffering from mental illness such as schizophrenia or you're a delusional psychotic, you have essentially a psychic immune system that has failed. And I think that's basically what the whole film, The Exorcist, is telling us, is that the young girl, her, you know, what was her name, Reagan, her psychic, her psychic immunity because of the situation in the family, approaching puberty, where she was at the time, the mother's psychological state, everyone around her, the infection creeped in to the psyche. And this is really what these stories are telling us. They don't, they tell us that if you don't get your shit together in your own life, the demon will come knocking on your door and it'll come from the lowest part of your, the lowest part of your subconscious mind. And this, I think Carl Jung called them autonomous complexes. They may have actually even be a manifestation of our own personalities, almost yeah. like our psyche doing correctional work upon us. Yeah, but they do happen. They do happen, and that, so I mean, I, peep. You know, you can say, "Oh, it's just a silly horror film." Yeah, no, you know, Jason from Friday the Thirteenth isn't real. You know, isn't real. Frankenstein isn't real. Dracula isn't real. But I can tell you for a fact, Pazuzu is. Yeah. Maybe not as a being, but as an energy force, he exists, mm. and that to me is what makes that film so powerful. It's not dealing with imaginary horror, supernatural horror. It's dealing with real psychic horror. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's all in the mind too. Yeah. I I totally agree with that. You know, I mean I'm I don't subscribe to any particular like metaphysical outlook or anything like that. But again I know I've <clears throat> I've had my own experience, you know, and this is why it was kind of scary is because um I think the first real indication that we had in this film that something uh, supernatural was um happening was when Reagan said that her bed was was rocking. And that was that was exactly what happened to me, you know, in my experience. And I, again, I think I was uh, 12, 13, something like that. And um, yeah, I just I woke up in the middle of the night and my bed was rocking like a cradle, you know, and I could feel it and I could see it and I was absolutely awake. And I was, you know, and then I remember seeing yep. these these eyes glaring out of the dark at me, you know, they look like cat's eyes or something like that. And it, and it, and just absolute terror, you know, com absolute, complete. I was petrified. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe, you know, and so. People can poo-poo that all they want, but this is the kind of experience mm -hmm. that um, has come up again and again. And so when I see these descriptions of these you know, events happening in film, and then I think back to my own experience and how similar they were and how similar so many of the other stories were, you know, I, um, you know it, it can't simply be dismissed. And I, 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 my own gut has, has told me that, that, yes, that this is the fact that this happens around puberty or just before puberty to, to most people, at least if it does happen, is usually some kind of a manifestation of a, you know, of, of, con of subconscious conflict in some way. You know, you're going through a lot of changes, you know, perhaps there's, you know, trouble at home or, or you know, anxieties in your own life. And because you don't have those psychological defenses up, because you haven't really figured out who you are yet, and because you, you can't quite make sense of the experiences on a conscious level, I think a lot of the time that these can be Perhaps it's either a manifestation of something within your own consciousness or perhaps you're, you know, letting the door open for, for something else to come and toy with your own consciousness. But, um, yeah, I think they're, they're deeply related to the individual. 
it's it's sad that the world we live in just wants to uh, at every occasion just throw all this stuff out and say no that's just stupid it's unscientific and uh, there's nothing to it therefore we're just going to ignore it all and if you do do that you put yourself in a very da- dangerous situation like you're saying Thomas with the millennials are opening themselves up to being total victims for this because they're not going to have any uh, they're going to have nothing to fall back on like well what do I do this is just a bunch of nonsense in my own head it doesn't mean anything because you know what do thoughts in my mind mean they're not real that you can't touch them you can't feel them and so this creeping in of scientism in society is uh that to me, that's that's the most disturbing aspect of this whole film. Is is that is the reality of what's actually happening? It's happened more and more since this film was made, and yeah, I, I don't know. But do you, anything, uh, Thomas, that you have to say to kind of like close close this show here? Because I think we're coming towards the end. Yeah, I think in two, you know, nineteen seventy three, a little girl made a movie that shocked the performed scenes. In a in a in a film that shocked and stunned and traumatized the world in 2016, that'd be in a pop music video. Yeah, yeah. I'll leave it with that. I'll leave it with that. And let anyone that you that people analyze that any way they want. Mm. Yeah, well, that, fair enough. That kind of that kind of says it, doesn't it? You know, it really kind of says it. I mean, I, I, if I was to, to to sort of make another fi- final closing comments, I. I guess I just had some some vague thoughts about this being some kind of a not a, no, I'm not going to go and say social experiment, but again, if we talk about the fact that some some of the characters in this film seem to have some kind of a deeper understanding of what was going on, this is happening in a high society setting. Yeah, I just I I wonder as to whether there is a deeper message that we haven't quite uncovered in this, and that this is uh, you know n- not 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 to. Um, not to say that the, the meaning that you had just described to it, Thomas, is, is you know, irrelevant, because I think that's absolutely what, you know, what, what the deeper meaning is here. But it's, it's almost as if there was a, another story being told in regard to yeah, people knowing yeah. what was going on, some kind of experimentation, some kind of, um, some, some kind of foreknowledge or, or higher understanding of what's happening um, between all these institutions. Um, you know, just given the, the the locations and the plot devices that they've used in this film, so yeah, I mean, people can think about that as well. Um, I'm not yeah, sure. and I'm not I'm not putting a moral I'm not putting a moral thing on this. I don't, you know, I'm not I'm not saying we've we've morally gone down. I just think we've always been pretty dis, pretty disgusting from the top to the bottom in society. It's been imposed upon us. But I'm not so I'm not saying it's like there's a morality thing here. What I'm just pointing out that what shocked shocked people in the past is now normal to them. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, I'm I'm not saying I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Miley Cyrus is what she does. That's her. Are people being into that? I'm not saying I'm offended by. It. I'm not a Christian. I couldn't give a shit. I'm like I'm not. I don't care about those things. I really can't give a shit. Uh, that's one of the problems. Of this, one of the reasons I got out of the alternative and truth movement because of this fake Christian vital oh, morality. Yeah. That's all over the fucking thing, along with the the, the racism that crept in. Yeah. I don't give mm-hmm. a shit about this kind these kinds of things. I. I don't care where people put their pink bits or what they do with them. It's their own private business. And I know, I know that art is art. But I'm just saying, the engineers who've engineered society have engineered us towards a, shall we, just like I said at the beginning, a Pazuzu-friendly model. This is, this is it. And this has always been my point. And the point that I try and make is, is not coming from necessarily coming from a place of um, sanctimonious moral judgment about these things, but just simply saying, hey, look at this. This is something that was not shocking. You know, something, something, sorry, something that was yeah. very, very shocking a while ago is now par for the course now. And so we need to look at that and yeah. just ask as to, you know, why? What's going on here? It's, so. it's calling into question a process. You're not making moral judgments. People don't know how to critique processes at a macrocosmic social level. Without going uh, to the moral judgment, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that's what we're given because we, that's what we have to do. That's kind of like the mechanism we've been indoctrinated with. Like, well, you have to get morally outraged, otherwise it doesn't matter. And this is always, yeah. the, retort. This is always the retort you get when you make these comments as well. Is people say, oh, well, you're just, um, you know, you're, you're just you know, re- repressed and, and judgmental and, and hateful. And it's, well, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm just commenting as to what's real. You know? And if we, if we want to deal with what is, then we've got to look at what is. You know? So, yeah, very interesting film. Is there anything else you wanted to comment on, Aaron? 
uh, no, I th- I think we should just have uh, Thomas let us know uh, for listeners what your website is, any projects that you have they want people to know about that stuff. Well, okay, uh, where do I start? <laughs> I have a new book out called The Druid. Well, my website is www.thomassheridanarts.com, as has always been. My YouTube channel is Thomas Sheridan Arts. I have a new book out called The Druid Code about my sort of like 30 odd years crawling around holes in the ground, megalithic sites and fusing it with things like what we've been talking about tonight, mythology and so on. And what 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 really tells us, it's sort of like the first kind of philosophical tome I've written, but it's also a guidebook to the sort of like what they call the sacred sites of Europe. That's one thing I have a documentary series coming out that I'm one of the hosts of called Megalithic Odyssey, where I'm touring around Europe, uh, basically crawling down holes in the ground again. Uh, (laughs) That I've got, I'm working on on my own productions of uh, making the documentaries on occult uh, occult symbolism and occult, occult nature of European cities, but not doing it in a hysterical Oh, they're all Satanists. Boom, 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 boom. It's going to <laughs> lots be, it's lots going to of like, fire. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be like Adam's uh, Aaron's at the Age of Transitions. It will be a prosaic, well presented, no nonsense, no bullshit, hopefully artistically filmed and presented 45 minute documentaries that I'm putting together. Our first one is on Dublin. I'm going to do, do London, Berlin and a few other places, Vienna, and a few other cities, Prague. That's another thing I have going. My Velocity and Now radio show was on and off because I'm very, very busy at work at the moment. My regular daytime Matrix job, which I'm very happy to have because it keeps me grounded and sane and makes me realize that like a lot of the people in the alternative scene are mad. Yep. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they're not doing themselves any favors by locking themselves into it. And uh, Your books. And that's basically... Uh, oh, and, and loads of other things. I mean, yeah, I mean... Pu- geez, pu- pu- I, puzzling author. people, puzzling people and defeated yeah. demons. I recommend those to anybody that's listening. Those are two excellent books yeah. that Thomas has uh, written. And Valpurgis Knight and The Anvil of the Psyche. Yep, those okay. two. Um, yeah, thank yeah. you. And uh, I'm a, look, I'm a workaholic by nature. Anything will happen. That's <laughs> basically it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, thank you very much for being here, Thomas. It's always great to talk to you. It's been, uh, as we said, literally years, so it's been great. Yeah, we'll have yeah, to. Have, brilliant here, we'll we'll have to have you on again. We will definitely have to have you on again as a, as a guest at some point in the future, or or perhaps any other format. Because I always enjoy our conversations. It's been great. Brilliant, and maybe we can do some other films. Maybe I'll, I mean, at some point I, I might suggest some films to you guys to talk about. Maybe something that might surprise you that you never you wouldn't necessarily watch. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. this is this is one example. I mean, I, I when you suggested The Exorcist, I, it came right out of left field. I wasn't expecting that, but I'm, I'm absolutely glad that we covered it because it's been an interesting discussion. Yeah. So, absolutely. But um, for people who are interested in the podcast, our uh, website is tmpodcast.com. Um, we also have a YouTube channel, uh, Themes and Memes Podcast. You can subscribe to the RSS on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Google Play, and TuneIn. And you can also get us on Twitter at Themes Memes. Thank you for listening. This podcast was recorded on the 20th of October, 2016.